I hope some of you slept better than I did last night, because I have a dog that one does not like fireworks and also does not like thunderstorms, so barked most of the night. Uh, and if you were either here last week as I kind of uh, prepped for what was coming this week, or you just looked ahead in Ephesians, you realized that today is some sensitive material as it relates to what the world thinks. Um, so today is going to be entitled Countercultural Submission. Uh, as we look at the role of the wife, and you may be looking to say, oh no, what happened? Jeremy's wife is not here. Uh, she is not boycotting this morning, um, but rather she and the kids uh, are up in Michigan. They were at a close family friend's wedding uh, last night and are uh, attending uh, up at Calvary where we used to be in Kalamazoo. Uh, so she, I talked to her this morning and she said, I wish I could be with you all this morning. And I said, I'll let them know that. And so as you are gone, so they don't think anything um, Else, And so in your absence this morning. Well, one thing that we really see in today's world is uh, the push to make the Bible seem irrelevant. To say that it was written so many thousands of years ago, the topics covered were from such a long time ago, we are advanced today, so we don't need God's word. So that is, is a big push. They say the Bible's old school, and what we experience today is very different than what they experienced back then, so it is no longer necessary. The world has progressed beyond its ancient writings. Those who truly study the Bible know that this simply is not true. One of the areas that is specifically attacked as uh, we see, and, and it's attacked as irrelevant, is gender roles and gender itself, specifically gender roles within marriage. The Bible is said to have been relevant possibly when it was first written to those people, but now uh, we understand differently is, is the push. This comes down to what is our understanding of truth. As Craig mentioned earlier, Jesus Christ is truth. Are we going to believe that man has the upper hand on what truth is, or are we going to trust that God is the only source of truth? Going into this passage today, I want to give away my stance and my bias towards this. I believe God is the only one who has truth, and he has revealed this truth to us in his word, the Bible. I, by conviction, uh, every week that I'm here, choose to share my understanding as I study of what this truth is, and not to rely on man's truth for various things that we come across in today's world. So this morning we're going to look at the first half of the first pair of what is known as the household codes as you look in this portion of Ephesians. You will also see these household codes come up uh, with Paul again as he writes to the Colossians, and you'll see it with Peter as he writes in 1 Peter kind of these ideas of this is how we are to operate as believers within the most common relationships that people would have been in uh, at that time, and it's obviously the most common for us. So those three relationships are husbands and wives, parents and children, and then uh, kind of slaves and masters. So those are the most common, and that's what we're going to be looking at in the weeks to come. So this week, we're going to look at what is a wife instructed to do within the context of marriage. The second half of this pairing is not going to come next week, but rather it's going to be in two weeks. Uh, Lauren is going to be here next week bringing us the word, and I would highly encourage you, come and listen and be encouraged uh, by the word of God through Lauren next week. Uh, so we're going to be going through these household codes 
understanding what does God want for us. And really, we have to take a look and be reminded of what is taking place before our passage today. Now, as we talked about, these are some building blocks that we have and we're looking at, and they're building on one each other, uh, and they're getting more specific as we see specific instructions for us. So if you're to look in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 1, we looked a few weeks ago at, therefore be imitators of God. That's our call. Be imitators of God. Know who he is. Know his attributes. And we are to live lives that reflect who God is. Be a light to the world around us. So as you go and and look further down the passage, built on that, it says in verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So we're supposed to be imitators of God, and then we're supposed to walk as wise people. He continues to build on this and says the way that we are to be wise in verse 18 is to be filled with the Spirit. And then as we look at what does being filled with the Spirit look like, he goes through these specifics, and then we get to verse 21, which we covered last week, and it says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Getting more and more specific, and he says, let me tell you how you are to submit to one another in reverence for Christ as we address these three pairs of relationships. So this week, again, as we look at the role of the wife, we see the primary instruction is submission. That's not necessarily a pleasant word that people like to identify with themselves, but that's what God calls a wife to do. That's why the title today is Counter-Cultural Submission. It feels old school. But we need to be convinced and know and understand and believe that God's word is true and relevant for us today as much as it was the day that it was first written. So as we look at submission, we need to look at why submission is the primary instruction given. We're going to look at what is submission, and then finally we're going to end with to whom is submission instructed? Who is the who related to submission. So we're going to read our passage now. So I would invite you, if you are able, to stand with me for the reading of God's word as we read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. And it says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. You may be seated. Let's pray uh, that our hearts and minds would be open to God's words uh, and that we would be humble as we look to apply it. God, we are thankful that you created everything in your power. And in your great wisdom, you decided to give us instructions into how to have relationship with you, how to have relationship with one another. Lord, we are going to look at the specifics of one of those relationships today. And in a few weeks from now, we're going to be looking at the marriage relationship. God, open our eyes. Help us to see where we do not measure up to your word. Help us to be humble to the point where we may say, I need to change this. God, our desire is to be imitators of you to reflect who you are to the world, to be light in a dark place for Jesus Christ. Be with us this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first point that we're going to look at today is the why of submission. The why of submission. We need to look at why submission is instructed 
Why is this the the specific instruction that's given to wives? There's a bunch of other things that, that he could have said, but he stuck to this, submission. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look a little bit at internal evidence in our passage right here. And we're going to look and say, why is submission, why, how does that fit here? And then we're going to look external to a different passage, and that kind of gives us some background to say why submission is so significant, and it is. So we've already looked through and see how does this build upon Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, and, and the following, and went through that. So what we're going to notice as we go through this part of the passage, is that each instruction given to wives, husbands, children, parents, slaves, and and masters are an explanation as to why, or how, I should say, we are to submit. If we look at the internal kind of evidence here, we look and say, if you look at verse 22, if you were to look in the original language, you would see that the word submit is not actually in that verse. And now you may be thinking, great, now we've added something in there. Uh, but it's in there in this idea because it draws it very strongly from verse 21. You cannot separate verse 21 and verse 22. Grammatically, they are intertwined together. That's where it kind of comes out of verse 21. If we were to look at kind of those verses, it would be submitting, verse 21, you could read it like this, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ as an example, wives to their husbands. So it's all part of the same idea. This idea of submission is directly drawn from verse 21. So we see all of these different roles have a way that we are called to submit. They have specific instructions, and the wife's specific instruction comes out of that initial word that's used there. We'll look at it in a little bit later to say what exactly does that mean, but we have to see how closely tied this is. Now, if we look at husbands, you go to verse 25, you see it fairly explicitly says, husband loved your wives as Christ loved the church and then so forth and so on, we could look at what the different ones are. But this verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord's, is directly tied to this greater idea of being filled with the Spirit, being drawn in to submit to one another, specifically wives to their husbands. Now we want to look at some external evidence. So to do this, I would encourage you to turn to Genesis chapters 2 and 3 with me. So we're in Ephesians. We're going to turn all the way to the Old Testament, first book of the Bible. This is coming just after the creation account, and it's pretty much tied to, and we're going to look at part of this creation account. Now, there's two things I want you to notice as we go back and look at kind of this external evidence, looking back all the way to Genesis The first is the order of the sequence of events. If you were to look back to chapter 2, verse 7, it says this, Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So the first thing that I want us to notice here is the creation of man. So this is, this is man who eventually is going to get to the point of being husband, but right now he is just man. So look to the next verse, 2, 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So God had already created vegetation and things right there, but he had kind of cultivated and created this garden specifically for man to live in. So we have man was created, then we have the garden was created, kind of formed. Creation of all the the elements have been there, but the garden was then formed. So skip ahead to chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So we see man was created, the garden was, was developed, man was placed by himself in the garden, given a mission saying, work the garden. This is all for any sin had taken place. 
Then we see next in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, it says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we have man was created, the garden was formed, man was put in the garden, and then the, the prohibition or the saying, do not eat of the forbidden fruit was given to only man. There's no other human being on the earth at this point. Then we go to 2.22. And so and this is kind of just the summary. And so we'll back up to 21. It says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on man, and whilst he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. Now we have woman being created. So we have originally man created, the garden formed, man placed in the garden, the prohibition, do not eat this, of this one tree, and then we have woman created. That's the sequence of events that we have going right now. Now as a side note, the first time uh, the woman was called wife was in 224. And so a husband will come in a little bit, but even when there's no parents involved, even when there's, there's nothing coming before, it even says, uh, talking about in verse 24, a man shall leave his father and his mother. There is no real father and mother. There's no children at this point. So we see that this idea of husband and wife was part of God's original plan for man before sin. It was created perfectly. So we see this sequence of events and we see woman becoming wife, Marriage of one man and one woman was always God's plan. So we continue to chapter 3, and we're not going to look at specific verses here, but we'll give some summaries. We have this crafty serpent that enters the scene. And instead of approaching man, who was the original person that was created, who was placed in the garden, who was the first one to be given this, this command to not eat of the forbidden fruit... He doesn't approach man. He approaches woman to bring this original temptation. The woman and the serpent have an interaction, and then we're brought to verse 6. And this is important, so let's read this one again. I said that we weren't, but I, I lied, and so we'll go there. So chapter 3, verse 6 says, So when the woman saw that this tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So as we look at this passage, we, we kind of run into all sorts of problems. And so things are spiraling out of control. Things are not going well. There is deception by the serpent. There is an appeal to the eye, what has been declared forbidden. There was the taking and eating of what was forbidden by the woman. There is a giving to the husband who apparently was with her at that time, but was not directly involved in the back and forth with the serpent. There was an eating of the fruits by man also, who was the one to receive the original prohibition? Things are not going well. The things that God said, do not do, we see the sequence of events leading to, they did it. This was original sin. Now, we're not going to get into speculation, because there's a lot of things you could speculate about here. We're not going to speculate on why didn't the serpent talk to the man? Why didn't the man stop his wife? Or why didn't the man refuse even if the wife did eat herself and, and, and he chose to anyways? We don't want to go beyond what Scripture tells us, those, though those are some strong questions. We do know that man is created first. Man was placed in that garden. Man was forbidden from eating the fruit. Woman was created. Woman ate of the fruit and her husband followed her. That's the order that we know. We need to focus on 
her relationship with her husband. And actually, you may be wondering, how in the world does this apply to what we're talking about in Ephesians today? What's the connection that we see there? What brings this together is God's response to this sin. There was a curse that was placed on the serpent, placed on the woman, and placed on the man. And we see this curse is directly tied to this. Uh, If we jump to 3.16, we see the results of their sin, and we see that it says, To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. The two parts of this curse for the woman specifically are pain in childbirth and the relationship to her husband. And the relationship to the husband is what we want to focus on at this time. That leads us to the phrase, let me just say it again, your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now, the desire that's being talked about in this passage is not like a physical desire that one would have for their spouse. It's not like a, an emotional desire that you have to be with them. And so there's the assumption that that's already present. So it's a different desire. What is this desire? We see this same word for this idea of desire in chapter 4, verse 7, when it's talking about Cain, their son. And talking to Cain, and so as he's going through this, uh, bringing this wrong uh, sacrifice to the Lord, there's a response that's saying, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you bring the right sacrifice, won't you be accepted? And it says, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you but you must rule over it. So this desire that sin has for Cain, this desire is to master him, to rule over him, to control him, to consume him. So it's the same desire that says, sin wants to rule your life. So we look back to the part of the curse that's given to the woman. It says, your desire will be for your husband." There will be a desire for you to run the show, to control things, to take the authority that was given to the husband. He says, the wife, there's going to be this desire for you to take that authority, take that control. I don't want to leave us hanging because we kind of have the, the second part of this curse talks about Adam and it says he will rule over you. So I want to address this real quickly, even though it's not specifically talking about the role of the wife. But this rule that's talking about Adam will rule over his wife also is not positive. It doesn't go to this dominion that we see that's in creation order back in chapter one, where it's a good thing for humans to kind of oversee, to tend the garden, to care for the animals, to care for for the earth that God created. He said, you are to rule it. You are to have dominion over it. That's not the same word that's used for him that says, your husband will rule over you. But rather, this rule is... uh, It's not that delegated authority that God gave, but it is an authoritarian rule. Not a part of God's original design. It's this rule to take things kind of in our hands and to say, this is the way that it's going to be. This is where we have the battle of the sexes originally starting where we have God's original creation order that he gave to man and woman, and it's already being perverted by sin. It's already being eaten at its core and just saying, this is going to be your heart's desire that you do not follow what should be. We see that there are problems on both sides that lead to difficulty in marriage if we give in to our fleshly desire and what we think is best for the marriage relationship. So I want to go back to the significant point that we're going to be focusing on of this verse, and it says part of the curse is that there will be a pull for the wife to control her husband. 
This is the opposite of submitting to his leadership. That's why this is a big deal in Ephesians. It's going all the way back to the curse and just saying there's this draw to not do what God originally created us and the way that we are to live in relationship with one another. God is calling wives to submit to the original creation order and not usurp the God-given authority given to husbands. This is, this is honestly where it begins to start to, start to sound harsh in today's world where, man, we don't want to be submissive to anyone, really. When we talk about other authorities, authorities is often a harsh term that we don't appreciate. But I beg of you, hold on to that tension that, it, that may be building until we see how kind of God resolves this. And so as we look at God calls, what God calls man or the husband to do in a couple weeks, I hope you will see that the original creation order between the husband and wife is designed to be a beautiful picture that promotes flourishing on both sides rather than restriction. We see the restriction because that's what we're conditioned to see, but we miss the way that if this is lived out properly, flourishing can take place between a husband and wife. So that is, uh, that's kind of the, the why of submission. What we're going to do is looking at now, the second point is the what of submission. What is submission anyways? As we look at this passage, and I encourage you to turn back to Ephesians, uh, we're going to look at a, a few key things that are in there. And going back to, to chapter Five, looking specifically, at, again, at 22 to 24, it says initially, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So if we see the what of submission, we see first that it is a willing action. It's a willing action taken on by the wife. If we look at this instruction, it's given to wives. It's not given to husbands to say, husbands, make sure that your wives submit to you. That's not the way it works. But rather, it's given to wives and says, wives, you are to submit to your husbands. So this is a willing action to submit. Too often, this verse or this idea has been used as a mallet by husbands to get their way in marriage. That's because we don't understand what it's actually saying. We don't understand God's original intent as it's used as that mallet. That's a wrong understanding of Scripture. We also see, as we look at the what of, of submission, that submission of the wife is different than the actions that are called upon by the other two pairs in the household codes. If we were to look at the role of children, and if you were to look at chapter 6, verse 1, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord's. If we were to jump down to verse 5 and see the slaves, it says, slaves, obey your earthly masters. Wives are not called to obey their husbands. That's not the specific instruction that's given. It's intentionally different. If there was no needs, and if they wanted to all be the same, there would have been the same word used for all three. And if you were to look at Colossians, it's different there. If you were to look at 1 Peter, I believe it's chapter 2, it's different there. It's, there's a different idea between what the wife is called to do in that relationship and then children and slaves on the other side. It's submission. So if we're to nail it down, what is Submission. We talked a little bit about believers submitting themselves to one another from verse 21 last week. And what did that look like? We saw that it was a laying down of our desires for the desires of others. Not making sure that we are getting what we want at the expense of others. But rather saying, I'm willingly going to submit to someone else's desires, which means there are times that I lay down what I want for the wants and needs of others this idea of submitting to one another. 
We consider the desires of others greater than our own. That's what we're all to be doing. We take on humility with others and do not consider ourselves greater than them. In our passage in Ephesians, we don't just have one believer submitting to another, but rather we have the role of a wife as willingly placing themselves under the authority of another being their husbands. This is one role submitting to the leadership of another role. This is out of an understanding of what headship means. We see that the reason given is that the husband is head of the wife. But even a greater description, we see the example of the church submitting to the headship of Christ. Now, we, I mentioned this when I was first here, so it's been a little bit of time, but I just want to, let's remember this for a second. This does not mean that the value of a man and a woman is different. In the eyes of God, we are all equal. There is no distinction when it comes to salvation. Salvation is extended to every single one of us equally. So it's not the idea that one of the genders is better than the other. In God's eyes, we are equal. We are of same value. All of us need Christ the same amount. Grace is extended to every single one of us equally. But rather, this is a role that God has called us to. And he says, I am creating an order that I believe is best. And he says, husbands, you are to have this role. Wives, you are to have this role. And you are to operate together in this fashion. So we look and and we see this role of the wife submitting is compared to the church to Christ. Now, if we look at the church and take a step back for a second, we make decisions all the time. We, uh, next week, we're going to be voting on a proposal that's coming from the elders. So if you're a member, I would encourage you, please be here for that vote. That's going to be significant because we make decisions as a body. Each year, we make decisions on how we're going to spend the money that is given to the church. How do we best utilize this to the glory of God? The church makes that decision. We make decisions on how we are going to attempt to to reach our community and the world with the gospel as we have local initiatives and we're sending people across the world. Church discipline is the church making a decision on who should or should not be considered part of this fellowship based on actions that we see in evidence in their lives. Sometimes it's very clear what Christ as the head of the church wants us to do. He says, do this. We should, as a church, do that because he's leading, guiding, and directing. Sometimes we have to apply general biblical principles because we don't have a do this exactly. So we have to say, what is God's heart towards this? Let's understand what he as our head wants, and then we can move forward in that direction. And that's why we need the body to be able to help us know and understand how to move forward. Our goal all throughout this, though, is to submit to Christ as our head. If the head instructs the body to do something and the body refuses to do it, we have a problem. And so we see a lot of sicknesses in the world today where that takes place. I think of my brother in Guillain-Barre syndrome. He was fully consciously aware of what was going on, but his mind telling his body to do something, and it just wouldn't do it. We knew then there was a problem. In the same way, spiritually, we have a problem if the body does not follow the instructions of the head. If the body also acts on its own outside of the instruction of the head, we are an improperly functioning body. If the body, my body starts doing things and my brain is not telling it to do that, we have problems. This is the example that Paul sets for the believers as it relates to the headship of the body. A wife is not to act independent of her husband. She is to submit to the leadership of the husband. This is part of marriage and becoming one flesh. We submit to the marriage roles that God designed. Peter also talks 
about these household codes, as I mentioned before. And he kind of gives some, some additional instruction to this to help us understand and see uh, kind of the what of submission. Uh, so listen to what Peter has to say in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, I believe it gives us additional understanding to the role of the wife. He says this, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of the wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of clothing, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious. So the submitting of a wife is characterized as respectful and pure conduct. This is supposed to be so impactful that if the the husband is not a believer, they're drawn to say, what is going on with my wife? Now let's, let's think back for a second. These roles are evidence of being filled with the Spirit. These roles, that filling of the Spirit is being a wise person, that's being an imitator of God. So all of this is to point people to who God is. So even to the extent that it says, wow, there is something going on. I am drawn to this. Help them to be drawn to Christ. Characterized as respectful and pure conduct. It's not focused on what's seen on the outside, but a focus is on the heart and having that gentle and quiet spirit. Again, we see this as a very high calling, and we're maybe thinking, man, this this bar for wives is so high. It's difficult. It doesn't seem to be pleasant at times. But this is only half of the equation. It's designed to work in tandem with what we're going to see in two weeks as we look at Paul's instructions to the husbands. We are seeing this idea of submission starting to come into view, and we need to understand the who of submission. So that's our third point this morning, the who of submission. Going back to our passage, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. The wife is to submit to the one that she possesses as her husband. This is not a call for wives or women to submit to all men. This goes back to creation order where that that husband and wife become one. There is one body, one head. They come together as a single unit. Otherwise, the picture of the head and the body and Christ to the church would not be applicable. Paul makes it clear that the wife is to submit within the marriage relationship to her husband. Here in Ephesians, in his writing of the household code of the Colossians also, and we see that again in 1 Peter 3. So in all three places, it only is to their husband. That's the special, unique relationship being discussed. All tied to that marriage relationship. We also see that submitting to her husband is an act of obedience and worship to the Lord. Paul says in our passage that wives should submit to their husbands as to the Lord. He tells Colossians to submit as is fitting to the Lord. This is a reminder that we are ultimately, as believers, responsible to act in obedience to the Lord. With Christ as the ultimate authority, this means that if the leadership of the husband or the headship of the husband goes beyond what is written, if there is a a discrepancy, if if they're butting heads, what the husband wants and what the Lord wants, the Lord always wins. The precedence goes to the Lord. So we need to make sure that we're always following the Lord. When the apostles were told to stop preaching the gospel in Acts chapter 5, they responded in verse 29 with, we must obey God rather than men. That's the order. I mean, you talk about submission to the husband, 
That is delegated authority by the Lord. So everything has to fall back and say, is the husband following what God's word is supposed to do? When the husband and God are going in two different directions, still as much as she can, responding with respectful and pure conduct, wives defer to God. So how does this practically look? How do we respond to this? First, see your role as wife first and foremost as worship to God. We need to see our roles, both husbands and wives, as we do this out of worship to the Lord because we want to please and honor him first. In any role that we're given, we do that. In any part of scripture, that is our priority. The Bible is true and relevant today, so we understand that God has specific instructions for those within a marriage relationship, and we do that for his honor and his glory. Another thing is to submit to and foster the husband's leadership. God did not design wives to lead the family. That happens often. We see it. This is hard at times when so many wives are such good leaders. It takes intentionality and patience oftentimes to follow the husband's lead. I'll be, to be honest, there are many areas where Kelly would actually be a better leader than I would. She is a very capable, she's a strong, and she's an amazing woman. She just would be a good leader in so many areas, but it's in those areas especially that she needs to express patience, and she does, and oftentimes grace needed when I fail. And looking at those situations, she is so much the best support that I could ever ask for. Areas that she is maybe more qualified than I am. So wives actively seek ways to support the leadership of the husband. Going back to Genesis, you see the wife was created as a helper to man. They are to work together. There is supposed to be a unique and intimate relationship there. Another way to submit to husbands is to not act independent from them. The body does not act independent from the head. That doesn't mean you have to do absolutely everything with him. That would be kind of weird. But it does mean that you are on the same page before you embark on a new adventure. A new venture, maybe something that you are wanting to do or needing to do. The head and the body need to be in sync to function properly. Discuss whether it fits family priorities, goals, and direction in life together. Work on that together. Be there together. A priority for both husband and wife should be to never have a hidden part of life that the other is unaware of. Be completely transparent. Move forward in life as a single unit. Finally, if you look at your life and you're saying, that doesn't describe me and our family. It may be that you need to reach out to someone that's a godly older lady and say, I need help. Maybe coming alongside your husband saying, this isn't working the way God designed. We need to change some things. That's hard. That's going to be difficult. I would encourage you to have a godly couple that can come alongside and provide assistance in that. Ultimately, we, again, we see this as one half of the bigger picture. One half of the equation, I really hope that you're able to be here in two weeks so we see, again, how this is going to fit together as a beautiful picture. Fit together as a single unit where actually we are encouraged, each of us, to do our roles of self-sacrifice. It's significant. It's huge. God, we stand before you in awe not completely understanding why you would send your son for us. Not completely understanding why you love us like you do. And God, we, we 
drop to our knees and we say, thank you for your love that was manifested, made known to us through your son and his death on the cross, his blood being shed for us. God, I pray that you would give us a desire to give you honor and glory. Help us to have a desire to not be satisfied with the way our lives currently are, but to always have desire and motivation to live more and more like Christ daily. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace this morning.